So I got good grades in the things that I liked and the people that I encountered, the characters that I encountered, uh, as with books. Uh, but I didn't get along with the things that I didn't. And uh, so finally, when I was about to enter my junior year, uh, my father took me out and put me in art school. And he figured that, that I'd probably had enough general education, but I needed to learn how to do something. He didn't know what, but he, there was a fine art school there called the Chenard Art Institute, which is now, now called the California Institute of the Arts. And they have a fine animation division there, probably the best in the world, which was a curious thing because so a lot of the young people that went to uh, Chenard Art Institute became the backbone of, of the animators that made the pictures which followed in due, in due time. So in that sense, and really in only that sense, did my father uh, lead me. He didn't lead me into cartooning. He led me into, into the, the work of, of learning how to do, to draw in a pra practical way and not just out on the, going out and drawing anything you wanted to. I would say my mother had more to do with my education as an artist, if you want to call us artists, uh, than anything else. And, and that was because all of us drew, and all of us grew up and went into different kinds of, uh, of field of graphics. My sister is a fine sculptress, and my other sister taught art and taught painting and so on, and my brother was a, a fine, uh, it still is, a very, very fine painter and a photographer, and, uh, but all of us went into it. Why? Because we weren't afraid to go into it. My mother said, and I, I, I didn't realize how, how well it worked, because I wasn't conscious of it. But when she would, when I bring a drawing to her, she said, I don't look at the drawing, I looked at the child. And if, they, if the child was excited, I got excited. And then we could discuss it, because you know, we're bringing something, meant something to me as a child. And so she would join in my lassitude, or my excitement, or my, uh, or, or my frustration. And, and, by, and she wasn't a psychologist, but she did understand this simple matter. Which always comes back to, uh, the, it also, it accomplishes the only thing that has any meaning to a little child. The only thing that an adult can give a child is time. That's all. There isn't anything else. If you give them time, that's what they need, and that's what the only thing they need, really, is time. And if you give them time, you'll have to be understanding of them when you give them time. I went through art school, and I, and I came out of there. I was hoping, this was, uh, 1933, 1931, and that was right in the Depression. The Depression hit in 1929, 20, two years before Franklin Roosevelt came in, and the, the, with the, the whole United States was boom, flat. To expect to get a job when, uh, when, when probably three out of every ten people were, were unemployed uh, was, was ridiculous, and particularly a kid coming out without any experience in anything. Uh, well, I, I, I'd helped. To a certain extent, it helped my work my way through art school by being a janitor. But when I came out, uh, one of my friends who had been at Chenard with me had gone to work with Walt Disney's ex-partner, a man by the peculiar name of Ubby Iwerks. <laughs> and he was the one that animated most of the Disney stuff. Disney was not a good animator. He didn't draw well at all. And, uh, but he was a great idea man, always was, and a good writer. And Iwerks was a great artist and a great animator. And he started his own studio. Somebody convinced him that he was the brains of the outfit and, and the talent, so he left. Anyway, he, he was hiring people, and he hired this friend of mine named Fred Kopetz. And Fred called me up and uh, asked me if I, if I wanted to go to work. So to my extreme astonishment, which has for 63 years held, I've, I've, <laughs> I'm still astonished that somebody would offer me a job and pay me to do what I wanted to do. And to this day, that's been the astonishment of my life and the delight of my life and the wonder of my life and the puzzlement that anybody would be so stupid as to be willing to do that. And I hear all these success stories of people, you know, the, these, these captains of industry and so on, these forgers of, of the world and empire builders and so on. And, and they talk about you know, all the money they made and you know, become presidents and all that. And I thought, geez, but, but look at me. I, I, I never, when I was offered a chance to be head of studios, I wouldn't take it. I like to work with the tools of my trade, and the tools of my trade is a lot of paper and a pencil, and that's all it is. But I started out with what they call a cell washer, the celluloids that the, the, the paintings eventually end up, uh, that go into the camera, 
in animated cartoons, which is simply the character uh, inked in, in black and then on the uh, opposing side of the celluloid you put the color so that the ink lines are one side and the colors on the other. So, you, so in those days, of course, there wasn't color. These were black, black and white, but they were made the same way. But those cells, and they were really celluloid in those days, uh, they cost seven cents a piece. And so it seemed foolish after you'd finished a picture and used the three or 4,000 drawings that were used in those simple days in a seven or eight minute cartoon. Afterward, why well, you washed them off and used them again. <laughs> if you had a couple of those, two of those, particularly of Mickey Mouse, if one of those black and white Mickey Mouses recently went at, uh, sold at auction in, in New York for $175,000. And they were washing them off too. <laughs> it's ridiculous. But it's just a question of, of uh, nobody thought to save any of them. And why should they? They weren't worth anything. So that was my first job, was washing that off. And then I got, and then I moved up to become a painter, and that was to put the, the color, or black and white, some color. And uh, then I went up to become an inking, which is more, which takes the animator's drawings and traces them onto the celluloid. And then I became what they call an in-betweener, which is the guy that does the drawing between the drawings that the animator makes. That was 1933 I went to work for Leon Schlesinger, and that's where I stayed for 30 years. And uh, um, Leon was a, had formed a company called Pacific Art and Title, and to this day that company exists and does a lot of the title work for various studios, an independent studio. Uh, Leon had, uh, he looked very much like a, an old-fashioned song and dance man, but he was a little older for that thing. He was the kind of guy that wore pointed to, pointy toes, as we say. Pointy, well, but he, uh, fortunately he was very lazy. And, uh, and uh, all he knew was that he made pictures that Warner Brothers would bought. bought. Uh, somewhere in the, he, he was an in-law. I think he was married to one of the Warner's sisters or something, I don't know. Anyway, there, there, was, there was a familial relationship there, there of some kind. And uh, he made pictures and sold them to Warner Brothers. And he didn't care, as long as they bought them, that was fine. Well, Leon Slesher was very lazy, and that was stood to our advantage because he didn't hang over us or anything. He 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 spent as little time in the studio as he could as he could. He'd come back and ask us what we were working on, and we we knew he wasn't going to listen no matter what we said. Uh, so we would say something like, "Well, we're working on this picture with Daffy Duck, and and it turns out that Daffy isn't a duck at all. He's a transvestite chicken." And uh, and he would say, "That's the boy. He's put in lots of jokes. He had a little lisp, and said, I'm off to the races." And uh, so he'd go charging out, and if you don't know what a wraith is, it's where horses run. And so one day when he went out, Tex was directing, I was animating at that time, and Bob Clampett was animating too. And uh, Cal Howard, one of our writers, said, uh, said to Tex, he said, you know, that voice of Leon's would make a good voice for, for Daffy Duck. So we called, he called in Mel Blank and went over, and he said, can you do uh, Leon Schlesinger's voice? And Mel said, oh, sure, I can do, you know, it's very simple. I mean, <laughs> and he said, how much do you want me to do? And he said, Okay, so they, they recorded all the voices and everything. The one thing we forgot, though, before the picture was halfway into work, was that Leon was going to have to see that picture. It was worse, he was going to hear it, and he hear his own voice coming out of that duck. I expected to be fired. <clears throat> In fact, we all wrote our resignations that all of us had worked on the film. film we figured it would, it would, the director and the animators would be canned. So we all wrote this, our, you know, and figured we'd resign before we got fired. Fortunately, we didn't send them in. Because Leon came crashing in that day, as he usually did, and and, uh, and he assembled all the troops to watch the picture. So Leon jumped up on his platform, and, and in order to make us feel good, he said, "Roll the garbage," and <laughs> that was what he always said. You know, it made you feel like he really cared. And um, so they rolled the garbage, and of course everybody in the studio knew that the, the, the drama, the situation. So nobody laughed, of course, but he he didn't care. He, he never paid attention to what anybody else did anyway. Or I heard, and uh, it was only his opinion that counted. So at the end of the picture, there was this deathly silence, and you could hear crickets, and, and you know, and a horse, a horse neighing like they do in westerns, and you know, way off in the distance, a, a dog bewailing our death. And uh, but uh, Leon jumped up and jumped up and looked around, and glared around, and we thought, boy, here comes the old axe. And he says, Jesus Christ, that's a funny voice. Where'd you get that voice? And 
And so that was the, that was what it was. And he never, he went to, and he went to his uh, unjust desserts, doubtless taking his money with him. Uh, went to Nineveh and Tyre, but, but the voice lives on as long as Daffy Duck's alive, why Leon Schlesinger is there in his corner of heaven. Well, it was, a, it was a cat by the unlikely name of Johnson, the only cat I've ever known who had a, a, a last name for a first name. I don't know what, what, uh, whether it was first name or his last name, but we were living in, uh, in Newport Beach, California, and uh, in a house, and this was around 1918. I was six years old, and uh, my brother and I saw this cat came to visit us, and, uh, or uh, take up residence, rather, as cats do. And uh, it was early in the morning, and he came strolling over the sand dunes. And he was a, he was a cat that, that walked like this, like a prize fighter. You expect him to pull his pants up like a prize fighter does, you know, and go like this. And uh, he came over, and, and he, was, he had scar tissue over his chest, and one ear was slightly bent. And he had a tarry piece of string around his neck, and a little, like, we didn't use them those days, a tongue depressor, an old tongue depressor, and on it, and, in lavender ink, it said Johnson, well, we didn't, in rather crude lettering, and we didn't know that he was, uh, whether that was his blood type or, or his name or his former owner's name or anything, but we were, so we always called, we called him Johnson, and he answered to that as well as anything else. But of course, like most cats, he doesn't answer to anything. I mean, he answered to food, that's what he answered to. How much do you want me to tell you about Johnson? <laughs> Well, it's a very important story. It's important to me because I've, uh, it, it established once and for all in my mind that every cat is different than other cats. Anyway, uh, he came to live with us and he turned out to be a rather spectacularly different cat. He came up to my mother and uh, well, she was finishing her breakfast and she figured he wanted something to eat. And so we'd already explained that he was probably was gonna stay with us a while. And uh, so she offered him a piece of bacon and a piece of egg white and a piece of toast and so on, which, all of which he spurned. He was obviously had nothing like that in mind. And finally, in a, whim, in a little spurt of whimsy, which was typical of my mother, she gave him a half a grapefruit that still had quite a bit of grapefruit in it. And it, it electrified him. It was like he'd taken a hypodermic. And uh, he grabbed at that thing and he went at it like a, like a suddenly there was this flash of, of, of uh, a tortoiseshell cat whirling around with this thing. And then he came sliding out of it and they, and the thing slowly came to a stop, but it was completely cleared out. He cleared out the whole thing, and we looked at him in astonishment. Well, uh, and and so uh, uh, there must have been some juice that juice that goes through cats that was lacking in Old Johnson, because they, he loved grapefruit more than anything else in the whole world. He'd eat it until all the inside was gone, and sometimes he eat it in such a way that he ended up wearing a little space helmet, <laughs> which is really the whole grapefruit, with a flap hanging down on one side like a batter's. Uh, helmet. He was a he was a, quite a cat, and, but when he had it on, he seemed to like it, and that was long before anybody ever heard of space helmets. And um, and then uh, sometimes he'd walk out on the beach with this thing on his head, and until it really bothered him, then he'd, he'd kick it off. But then the second thing that, that uh, really amazed us, and I've never heard of a cat like that before, but he was he was a very congenial cat. He liked to be with people, and uh, and particularly with young people, he was. He was very fond of, of children. I was, I was the middle child. I mean, I was I was six years old. My brother's four, and my uh, sisters are eight and ten. Well, when we went swimming, and, and we'd all learned to swim early. One day we were swimming, and we looked around, and here was here was Johnson, out there swimming with us. And I don't know, you, I, cats. I don't know if you ever seen a cat swim or not. They can swim. They can swim very well, but. But they, they don't like it, or they don't seem to like it at any rate. He did, I, I think he really did, but, but uh, only this much of him shows. He looks like a very pug-nosed alligator with hair, you know, and <laughs> his eyes are showing above the water, and they, for some reason they grimace like this, and his teeth are hanging down, and, and most of them is underwater, but behind is the kind of, all the oil has come off their fur and trails behind them, and maybe a few seagull feathers and stuff. And, and, and then uh, when he got tired out there, he would come and, and put his arms up on our, one of our shoulders and sort of hang there for a while. And you look around, here's his thing. <laughs> well, it was all right as long as one, one of the people in the family 
But unfortunately, it wasn't always, because if he couldn't find one of us, he'd approach a stranger, and people would come out of the surf there, going, you know, with, with, with these, with these, uh, their face going, uh, uh, like this, and you knew that they'd met, they, they'd had a social encounter with old Johnson out there. But they always looked pretty disturbed. At any rate, um, uh, the great moment for, for Johnson came one time when he had eaten his, uh, uh, his grapefruit and it stuck on his head and he came out and strolled down the beach. We were up on the porch of our house, two-story house, looking down on the sand. And he started off toward the pier and uh, it happened the the uh, Young Women's Christian Association were having a, a picnic there. Well, not only had he, did he have his helmet on, but somewhere along the line he had found parts of a, of a, uh, a dead uh, um, seagull and and then it left a few feathers on his shoulders. So he was quite a sight. So he came down, he strolled down to where these girls were having a picnic. And uh, they took one look at this thing, like this with the feathers and the whole business. And so they all screamed and jumped up and ran into the ocean. Well, that was a technical mistake because, because of course, Johnson, being a gregarious sort, decided he would join. Maybe he wanted to join the group, I don't know, or maybe he was going to appeal to the Supreme Court, you know, that, that cats weren't, male cats weren't allowed in the Girl Scouts or whatever it was. And so he went in after them, and, uh, and uh, they left in various states of undress. I'm not in dress, I mean, their minds were boggled. And uh, I never saw so many girls that were so boggled. And um, they, didn't, they never came back to Balboa, not uh, Newport Beach. The basic thing about Johnson was that, uh, as I say, you cannot take anything for granted. You can't, uh, I'm not sure which point you're talking about, but, but the, the fact that he was different than other cats and that, that if you see a cat, you do not necessarily see all cats. Uh, he was not every cat, in other words, any more than any of us are really every man or every woman. And we do take that for granted, too. That, uh, of course, laid the groundwork so that when I got to doing things like, like Daffy Duck or Bugs Bunny or a coyote or so on, that's not all coyotes. That is the, the particular coyote, Wild E. Coyote, genius. That's what he calls himself at any rate. Uh, so he's different than others. He has an overweening ego, which isn't necessarily true of all, of all uh, coyotes. I've read it over and over again. And I, I recommend it, anybody, to get Mark Twain's Roughing It. You can still get it. And it's, uh, it was in two volumes. And he goes on when he lived in San Francisco, Silver City, and in, 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 uh, great, great history and, and charmingly told. I started reading when I was little, uh, just little, about three, I think, three and a little over three. My father felt that it was, that it was best if we, if we did our own reading. <laughs> he, said, he said he had too many things he wanted to read himself to waste his time reading to us. He said, if we want to read, learn to read. He said, hell, you, you learn to walk in two years, you can certainly learn to read in three. And so we all did. We all learned to read very early. And, uh, and he helped us by saying to it that we had plenty of things to read. And he would, uh, uh, in those days, uh, people moved a lot, and very often people left uh, their whole libraries. Now, you must understand, and anybody reading, uh, living today with the day of television and even radio and stuff, that in those days there wasn't any such thing. And there was, reading was what you did. That's how you found out things. That was the way you learned anything. Uh, even radio had not, in 1918 and 1919, when I was six or seven years old, uh, radio was just in coming into use in the Great War. And uh, nobody had a radio. And it wasn't in the 1920s when people began to have that. And, and even a phonograph or something like that was fairly expensive. And the old hand kind, they were marvelous, but but uh, we didn't have one until the 1920s. And uh, although my childhood was, was uh, stringent, it was, it was hardly, we were hardly living in, you know, in abject poverty at any time, but, but we were able to move to houses where they were loaded with books. And so there were four children and two adults, and we'd move into that house like a pack of locusts and go through all the books there. And then my father would go out and, and rent another, what he called a furnished house, which meant it didn't matter whether there was any furniture in it, but it did matter if there were books in it. Uh, Mark Twain, in, uh, in, in Roughing It, a book that many people don't know about, but I highly recommend to anybody of any age to read it. it he and his brother crossed the United States in a sta stagecoach. How, how romantic can you get? 
and uh, man, when they went from uh, from uh, Kansas City and uh, Independence, Missouri, and out across the Great Plains with four plunging mules or horses pulling them across the plains. And Mark Twain went on and started telling him the first time he met a coyote. And his expression, and I was six years old when I read this, and he said that the coyote is so meager and so thin and so scrawny and so um, unappetizing that he said a flea would leave a coyote to get on a velocipede or a bicycle. There's more food on a bicycle than there is on a, on a coyote. And, uh, and he said how the coyote always looked like he was a kind of ashamed of himself. And that no matter what the rest of his face was doing, his mouth was always looking kind of, you know, and kind of crawly. And, uh, and he, he has some wonderful expressions about how the coyote exists in that terrible environment, but how fast it is. And he says, if you ever want to teach a dog lessons about what an inferior subject it is, let him, let him loose when there's a coyote out there. There's one rule that I feel is vital, and I think it was set down by G.K. Chesterton, who said, I don't take myself seriously, but I take my work deadly seriously. Comedy is a very, very, very stringent business. And Jackie uh, Gleason said it's, it's probably the most difficult and demanding of any form of drama because you have an instant critic, laughter, if you don't get that laughter, then it isn't tragedy. You don't know whether people are suffering enough or not in tragedy, but in comedy, you know. And if you're making it for films, well, you don't know until you take it into an audience. I never had the courage to take any of mine to the audience. I mean, I would die. The first picture I ever made, I thought when it, that it wouldn't even move when it got out of there. And they had to lure me out to, you know, and I was in a terrible funk because to go out and see it in front of an audience. And it scared the hell out of me. And, and I pretended like I wasn't there, you know. And so we were sitting in the balcony of Warner's Theater in Hollywood, 1938, and, uh, and the cartoon came on and there was a little hesitate. And the little girl sitting in front of me said to her mother, she said, Mommy, I knew we should have come here. You know, I knew we should have come here, you know. The tenses get all mixed up. But I wanted to adopt her and take her home, you know, because she was laughing at six or eight years old. She wasn't in that terrible area. She'd been five. She would have destroyed me. All creed, creative endeavor, whether it be music or art or writing or anything else, is not competitive except with yourself. And all business and all manufacturing and everything that's presented to the public is competitive. They are trying to present the same object, perhaps, under a different name to supersede the other person. It's competitive. This is a foot race. But art can't be. Artur Rubinstein said that when he walks out on the stage and he looks up and there are 10,000 people or 2,000, whatever it may be, who have paid money to see him perform and they listen to him, and he said, I could not give them less than the best that I have. And that's what I feel anybody, or you have no right to diminish an audience's expectations. You have to give them everything that you have. Not only, and with children, it's anything that's supposedly being done for children. The requirement becomes much more stringent. You've got to do the best you can. You have no right to pull back. You have no right to write for children. You do the best thing that you can do, and if, if, if the audience is for children, all the more so. Because you're building the child's expectation of what is good and what is bad. And uh, uh, all this stuff, the, the word kid vid, which is used so freely, is one of the ugliest words in the English language. It means you're writing down to children. And how are you going to build children up by writing down to them? Again, I'll come back to that idea that, that uh, there is a one proof always as to what makes a great children's book or a great children's film. And that is this, if it can be read or viewed with pleasure by adults, then it has a chance to be a great children's film or a great children's book. If it doesn't, it has a chance. Every one of them should be, every, every, every film should be, should be pursued in that way. But I've always felt that the very best I can do is the very least I can do. 
I don't think about the audience. I think about me, and I think about uh, how grateful I am that I that I blundered into that group of whimsical, wild, otterish type people that were in there. All of them nutty and all of them intense. Because don't forget, they, we, we talked a lot about how free times were then, but every one of us had to turn out ten pictures a year, so in order to get the thirty that Warner Brothers needed, and uh, so. Uh, it was frivolous, to be sure, but and plenty of frivolity and plenty of laughter. But for every bit of laughter, there has to be a 90% of work. I do three to 400 drawings on every picture. I do three to 400 pictures that I used. But I would uh, sometimes I would uh, I might I might draw 50 drawings trying to get one expression so that it looked right for Bugs and or or Daffy or something like this. Sometimes it came quickly. But like writing, sometimes it, you come to a dead stop, and I'd have to haul off and go. I'd have to go and do something because I couldn't break through, couldn't find what they think guy was supposed to be doing, and that's all. You you don't have to worry about drawing. After a while, it's as easy to draw Daffy or Bugs or anything as just in movement. If I wanted to move from there, I know how to do that. But what's he thinking about? And I have to get that expression that'll indicate what he's thinking about. You have to trust one another, yes, and uh, a lot of marriages don't, and that results in bad pictures or bad marriages. Yes, you you you, you depend on them, and uh, I've often, when I'm halfway through a picture, I don't know what the hell I'm, how I'm going to end it, and I kind of, and then I have to think more carefully. How what would Bugs Bunny do in a situation like this? In other words, I can't think what I would do or what I think Bugs Bunny should do. I have to think what Bugs Bunny, I have to think as Bugs Bunny, not of Bugs Bunny. And, and drawing them, as I say, is not difficult. Just like an actor dressed like Hamlet can walk across and look like Hamlet, but boy, when he gets into the action, he has to be thinking as Hamlet. Bill Scott, he, he later did most of the work on, uh, on Rocky and Bullwinkle. He was really the, he was the voice of the, of the, of the, uh, of the moose and other voices, and he was the lead writer and that stuff. He was bright, bright. After the war, he came, he, he came uh, to work for us as a writer. And he was very proud he was there, and he wrote a letter to his grandmother in Denver and told her that he was writing scripts for Bugs Bunny. And she wrote back a rather peckish letter that indicated she wasn't very happy about that. And she said, I don't see why you have to write scripts for Bugs Bunny. He's funny enough the way, just the way he is. And he was delighted with that, and we were delighted with it. But it showed they, that everybody, I, 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 I really do believe that, and, and I'm, I think if you want to know what a triumph is, it's the feeling that people really believe these characters live, just like, like we did. But if we don't, you, there's no chance anybody else is going to. Directing, of course, is, uh, I say, is doing the, 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 the key drawings. Not the key animation, mind you, but I mean, if, 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 if the, pardon me, I'll cross my arms, if the coyote is falling, and like, I'm not imitating Jack Benny, but if he's falling and he looks at the audience, then holds up a sign saying, please, please end this picture before I hit, well, that's, what, that's, what the, that's his way of expressing himself since he can't talk. He does a couple of pictures, but mostly he does not. But I have to make that particular drawing to show what the attitude I want on the drawing. But the action of getting in there, or the action of running, the guy, or if he's a, he's going to fly like Batman or something like that, and putting on the, the uniform and falling off over the cliff and so on. But also, I have time the entire thing. Uh, it, it scares cameramen and anybody that works behind the camera to find out that in animation at Warner Brothers, we weren't allowed to edit. You, you couldn't overshoot. It was too expensive. So the anim, all of us as directors had to learn to time the entire picture on music, on bar sheets. And just like you were writing a symphony, uh, you know that's carrying it out a bit. But anyway, uh, so by the time and they came out to 540 feet, that's six minutes. And and so uh, uh, Leon Schlesinger wouldn't let us make him any longer than six minutes, and the exhibitor wouldn't let us make him any shorter than six minutes. So they had to be six minutes. So we had to learn to do that, and it drives people like like uh, George Lucas or Spielberg crazy. How, how can you make a picture without editing? Well, it is edited, but it's edited before it goes into work. And uh, there are a few live-action directors like Hitchcock 
a, a shot a meager amount, but not the way we did it. At Disney's, they, they always had enough money so they could overshoot. And they often would do entire sequences and take them out. And it was heartbreaking to the, first to the animator. Because where an actor might have a 15 second or 40 or 20 seconds scene, and then it would be over in 15 or 20 seconds, even if they did it three or four times, it would take less than 20 minutes. But with the animator, if he's animated, say, that runs, that runs 20 seconds, it might be two weeks' work. And that has been thrown out. I know something about it, but mainly it, it's through experience with working people like Carl Stallings and Stalling and, uh, and Mel Franklin. These were, they were two incredible people with, with great memories. And uh, Stalling was particularly useful because, uh, because he, had, he had been a, an organist in Kansas City. He, they said he came from that same area uh, during the silent picture days. And the Roadrunner, for instance, it's, people think of that as this Helter Skelter, but it wasn't. A, lot of, a big percentage of the music was Smetna's Bartered Bride music. And, in, and whenever I had undersea stuff or so on, uh, I always used uh, uh, Mendelssohn's uh, The Overture to Fingal's Cave, because it sounded that way. And then later when, uh, when we did How the Grinch Stole Christmas, why we used original music then, but curiously enough, the, the Christmas music was done to a, to a square dance call. We used the, the rhythm because it sounded right, and it was very cheery. Animation is going very well right now, and uh, to a great extent because these young people at Disney's that are doing the films, uh, we must understand this is a whole new generation. That starting with the Great Mouse Detective and Oliver and and the Little Mermaid and uh, and and, and uh, Beauty and the Beast and now the uh, Aladdin have all done by people in their 30s and 20s. And that's what we, where we started. We were all young like that. When I went into animation, I was like 17, and the old man of the business was Walt Disney, who was 29. Walt Disney was not 40 by the time he finished Fantasia, and so Snow White, the Seven Doors, and Pinocchio. And the people that worked with him were younger than that. So it takes young people, and that's what I, and I'm, I I'm, think I've, I've just about gotten to where I finished and uh, worked out a deal with Warner Brothers to do some more films. But I want to be the old man that pulls together the young guys. So if I can, I want to magnet, be a magnet in pulling in creative young people from the art schools and get them started again, doing some of our old characters, but in new, in new stories and so on, but new characters too. And hopefully a Warner Brothers feature, that's what I'd like to do. And I've written a couple of scripts about, you know, that are, are not too bad, I think.